Hi, I'm Ted Venema. Let's talk about acoustic reflexes. The acoustic reflex test is actually part of the tympanometry test. It's done right after tympanometry. But before we get into that, let's review a little bit what the acoustic reflex is and why we have it in the first place. Then we'll talk about how it's measured, okay? This is a complex or complicated picture showing the acoustic reflex arc or loop. The acoustic reflex covers a huge area. I mean, it covers the outer ear, the middle ear, the inner ear, the eighth nerve, the brain stem. So we're looking at almost the whole auditory pathway and any interruption along that pathway is going to show a problem with the acoustic reflex. That's why it's, it's a neat test to do. It too, like tympanometry, is non-behavioral and quick. In fact, the very term acoustic reflex automatically suggests it's non-behavioral. It's just an a, a involuntary reaction. So let's look at this picture a little more closely. The green arrows represent the afferent route, brain going. So sound is coming into the outer ear canal, going through the middle ear system, into the cochlea, up the eighth nerve, and to the brain stem. Now the efferent or outward going part is shown by the red arrows. This is showing messages being sent from the fifth nerve, cranial nerve, and the seventh cranial nerve, and these messages are sent to the tensor tympani muscle in the middle ear and to the stapedius muscle in the middle ear, respectively. Now you'll also notice a bit of a crossover here, because when, once you've hit the brain stem, that's where crossover or decussation occurs. So you're going to notice I drew a green arrow here, and now also an efferent message being sent to the other ear as well. So its fifth and seventh cranial nerves are sending messages to its tensor tympani and stapedius muscles respectively. So you can see that a loud sound put in one ear causes an acoustic reflex to occur in both ears. Why do we even have these in the first place? A lot of people think the acoustic reflex is like nature's own protection against noise or loud sounds. Really, that's fundamentally false. The reason we have acoustic reflexes is to dull the loudness of our own voices while we speak. To highlight this, think about listening to, you, to ourselves on a tape or on a recording. When we hear ourselves recorded, we hear our voices and we go, ugh. That's me? Yep. Everybody else says that sounds just like you. You're the only one that thinks it sounds weird. How come that is? Well, for the first time, when you're hearing a recording of your voice, you are hearing yourself through air conduction only. The sound is coming from the speaker of the recorder to your ears. And what's the average intensity of conversational speech? Around 65 dB SPL. Well, guess what? When we speak, we hear ourselves not only through air conduction, but we also hear ourselves through bone conduction. And when we have that combination, we hear ourselves at around 85 dB SPL. Guess what? That's enough to cause an acoustic reflex. So we have acoustic reflexes for this reason, to dull or lessen the loudness of our own voices while we speak. That way, we can better hear the snapping of a twig from something coming up behind us while we're talking. <laughs> so this, these are reasons why we've got the darn things in the first place. Let's talk about how they are tested. As we said, the acoustic reflexes are actually part of tympanometry. They're done just when tympanometry is finished. Now, when we, at the, when we talked in tympanometry, we said, that tympanometry changes the air pressure in the outer ear canal in order to find out what's going on behind the drum in the middle ear space. And we said in tympanometry, when the air pressure is even steven between the, ar the outer ear canal and the air pressure behind the eardrum, when those two air pressures are even, 
That's when the middle ear is most efficient. And in tympanometry then, we check to find out at what air pressure in the outer ear canal was the middle ear most efficient. And if it was most efficient at regular room air pressure, well then we could assume that the air pressure behind the drum was also room air pressure. Well, that was then, this is acoustic reflexes. Acoustic reflexes are tested at the air pressure, whichever air pressure yielded the tallest tympanogram, maximum compliance. That air pressure is fixed and now a loud sound is put into the ear and we want to find out did that loud sound cause an acoustic reflex. If it caused an acoustic reflex that would stiffen the middle ear system even more causing a reduction in compliance. So an acoustic reflex on a tympanogram really is shown as a reduction in the height of the tympanogram. All oh, the layout on the screen looks different, but essentially this is exactly what you are measuring. This distance, this reduction in compliance. Let's look a little closer. Contralateral and ipsilateral acoustic reflexes. Those are the two ways we can measure the acoustic reflex. Contralateral reflexes were tested first. And in so doing, here's the setup. You'll have a headphone on one ear, and you'll have the tympanometer probe in the other ear. Now the tympanometer, the, the, this system, is emitting the tone eh, steady, just like we did with tympanometry. A low pitched tone is constantly being spit out by the speaker here and picked up by the mic there. And all the while that that is going on, suddenly in this ear, a loud sound is put in. And when a loud, lower pitched, essentially 5 or 1000 hertz tone, when that's presented to this opposite ear at a fairly high intensity, that's sufficient to cause an acoustic reflex in both ears. Well, the diff the, this reflex will be measured here then. What will happen? This middle ear system will stiffen because that tensor tympani and stapedius muscle will tighten, and the tightening of those muscles causes more sound for a split second more sound to be picked up by that microphone. And that change in sound, the fact that when you put the loud sound in this ear, more sound is picked up suddenly for a split second by this probe, that indicates an acoustic reflex has occurred. Complicated, eh? Well, let's go and finish now the discussion with ipsilateral acoustic reflexes. Ipsilateral acoustic reflex is also testing the acoustic reflex, but it's doing it in the same ear. You're having the tone is being put in, here's the, here's the probe, it's stuck in the ear, and you're having the tone being put in, that constant low pitch tone, and it's being spit out by the speaker, picked up by the mic, airtight seal, just like we did, but suddenly you're putting a loud sound, this red arrow, in the same ear. And when you're doing that in the same ear and you're trying to find out is there a change in the amount of this tone bouncing back. So now we're really getting complicated. You've got two different tones going on. A loud tone here, the stimulus, and the response is a change or an increase for the split second that this tone is, is emitted, a sudden temporary increase of sound picked up by this mic, thus would indicate an ipsilateral acoustic reflex. Do we need to do all of this? No. Today, because we've got CAT scans, MRIs, we can detect brain tumors way earlier than we, better than we could. It used to be that audiologists would use both ipsilateral and contralateral reflexes to look at acoustic reflex patterns. But now we've got technology that supersedes the necessity for doing all of that. Pick one, flip a coin, do ipsilateral or do contralateral, it doesn't matter. Here's how we can conclude. Normal hearing people should have acoustic reflexes and they should kick in anywhere between 85 to say 100 dB HL. They should kick in at those levels. If you've got a conductive hearing loss, sayonara to acoustic reflexes because now you've got a, a bulge of pus in the middle ear that's going to obliterate any, any acoustic reflexes. So no acoustic reflexes with conductive loss. Sensory neural loss? 
you should have acoustic reflexes still until the, acoustic, until the sensory neural loss gets to be past moderate. So I'd say mild to moderate sensory neural loss, you should still get acoustic reflexes because you still have inner hair cell function. And in, acoustic reflexes are part of the inner hair cells or use the inner hair cells. Remember the inner hair cells send info to the brain. The inner hair cells are part of the acoustic reflex arc from outer to middle to cochlea, inner hair cells, to eighth nerve, to brain stem, back out the, the seventh and fifth nerves to the muscles, okay? So the acoustic reflex involves inner hair cells and mild to moderate sensory neural loss still has inner hair cells. So they should still get acoustic reflexes. When the loss is greater than moderate, now you've got damage to inner hair cells, so say bye-bye to acoustic reflexes. And eighth nerve tumors, will often show absent acoustic reflexes. If they are present, they will be present but at highly elevated levels. In other words, it's gonna take at least 115 dB to elicit an acoustic reflex, but usually an eighth nerve tumor will be associated with absent acoustic reflexes. At any rate, this has been a longer discussion than usual, but I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope we've all learned something. Thanks a lot.